Hi guys, welcome to today's session on intracranial hemorrhage. We'll talk about the four major kinds of intracranial hemorrhage, which include extradural, subdural, subarachnoid, and intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Before we talk about each of these in considerable detail, it's important we go back to a little bit of anatomy and understand the potential spaces present in the cranial cavity. So here in this cross section, here we see the skull and here we see the brain. And here we see the dura, arachnoid and pia, which are layers of the meninges. So between the endosteum of the skull and the dura, you have a space called the epidural space and any bleeding into this space is called epidural hemorrhage. Between the dura and the arachnoid, you have a space called the subdural space. Okay, it lies below the dura, so a subdural space, and any bleeding into this space is called subdural hemorrhage. Then again, between the arachnoid and the pia, you have a potential space which is called the subarachnoid space, and any bleeding into this space is called subarachnoid hemorrhage. Lastly, any bleeding directly into the parenchyma of the brain or directly into the brain tissue is called an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. So now let's talk about the most important one, the extradural or epidural hemorrhage. So remember, this is bleeding into the epidural space, the space that lies between the endosteum of the skull and the uh, dura, okay, dura mater. So remember, this bleed is usually arterial in origin and therefore it is an emergency. Remember, the arteries are a high pressure system. So any bleed which is arterial in origin will show a rapid progression and therefore become automatically becomes an emergency. A few most common or the few important points to remember about EDH. The most common cause of EDH is trauma. Okay. The most common fracture or most common bone fracture associated with EDH is your temporal bone fractures or temporal bone trauma even, especially at a site called the Tyrion, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And the most common vessel involved is the middle meningeal artery. So I told you it's arterial in origin and the middle meningeal artery is the most common vessel involved in EDH. So rupture of this middle meningeal artery leads to bleeding into the epidural space and blood starts collecting within the epidural space as shown in this image. So here you have a ruptured middle meningeal artery and blood starts collecting into this epidural space. And then this starts compressing or pushing onto the brain tissue and can even lead to complications like herniation as seen here. Now, let's talk a little bit about Tyrion, the most common site of injury which leads to EDH. Now, Tyrion is a meeting point of four skull or four bones of the skull and it is found on the lateral aspect of the skull. So, it is a H-shaped, okay, it is a H-shaped junction of the frontal bone, parietal bone, sphenoid bone and temporal bone and damage to this point leads to EDH because the middle meningeal artery lies just below this. So, remember this is a thin plate of bone. Also, it is the weakest point of the skull. So it is the weakest part of the skull, a thin plate of bone and damage to this plate leads to a rupture of middle meningeal artery and development of EDH. Now let's go to the clinical features and investigations. So clinical features, I already told you, usually the patient presents with the history of trauma because that is the most common cause. Usually a blunt force trauma to the abdomen or the lateral, uh, sorry, to the lateral aspect of the skull. Now. About the clinical features, remember all brain bleeds present with similar clinical features which include headache, vomiting and seizures, sometimes focal neurological deficits based on where the bleed is. But a very important or a very typical symptom of EDH is something called a lucid interval. So what is this lucid interval? Remember it is a period or an interval of lucidity. Lucidity means complete consciousness. So it is a period or an interval of complete consciousness which lies between two intervals of unconsciousness or altered consciousness. So remember, I'm going to tell you a classical presentation or a typical presentation for an EDH case. So you'll have a patient who comes with blunt force trauma to the usually lateral aspect of the skull or a blunt force blow to the lateral aspect of the skull, maybe even RTA. And with the blow it will be followed by a brief bout of loss of consciousness, following which the patient completely regains his consciousness 100% back to normal and then after a little while as the bleed progresses again goes back to loss of consciousness and this interval is called a lucid interval. So loss of consciousness followed by complete consciousness followed by loss of consciousness again is what we call lucid interval. Most important part of this discussion the CT imaging. So remember for most bleeds immediately the first investigation of choice is a CT because it can be done fast and on CT of EDH you see three things. Firstly, and most importantly, you see a hyperdense, okay, this white area, 
which forms a classical lens shape you can compare it with the gross image here again looks like lens shaped so lens shaped some say lemon shaped so a lens shaped or lemon shaped bleed the second thing you need to know is that there can be a midline shift so here you can see this is the midline and there is some shift here so midline shift lens shaped hemorrhage and sometimes you can see soft tissue injury on the outside so the here you can see some soft tissue injury suggesting a trauma to the lateral aspect of the skull and management i told you this is usually a arterial bleed so it has a rapid progression it starts compressing on the brain tissue and can lead to herniation and therefore it usually needs an emergency surgical evacuation so that was all about edh now let's move to subdural hemorrhage so remember this is a bleeding into the subdural space which is the space which lies between the dura and the arachnoid now unlike edh subdural hemorrhage is usually venous in origin and it arises from the bridging dural veins so the bridging dural veins are the veins which connect the cerebral veins to the dural venous sinuses and it is a rupture of these veins the bridging dural veins that usually leads to subdural hemorrhage so i told you venous bleeds are slower veins are low pressure systems compared to arteries so venous bleeds are slower so the onset and progression of this bleed and the clinical features in this bleed come a little later so it has a slower or a more gradual progression because it is a venous bleed so again look at the picture here you can see your nice lemon shape or lentiform shaped bleed this is an edh and here you can see an sth a venous bleed which has more of a crescent shape okay so it is a slow onset and because it's a venous bleed it takes time to progress a few important history related points to edh or clinical vignette points and those are firstly edh is more common in older individuals this is a very important point usually the clinical history given with the sdh sorry not a edh sdh is includes an older individual so remember older individuals have atrophy of the brain as you age the brain atrophies and when the brain atrophies the shearing force or the pulling force on the bridging dural veins or the dural veins increases and they become more prone for rupture so the first and most important thing is it is a venous bleed and it develops slowly the second thing which we spoke about was it is seen in older individuals a few other clinical pictures include patients on anticoagulants they are more prone to developing this and also on in alcoholics i'll tell you why in a second now the third thing is usually there is history of some trivial trauma some trivial fall some trivial uh, blow to the head not something serious like the edh usually a more trivial fall is associated with the sdh usually they'll give a history of a fall in bathroom or something and that is why it's more common in alcoholics because like i said alcoholics have, have a greater tendency to fall and have trivial falls and therefore they have they are more prone to developing a subdural hemorrhage so sdh may be acute or chronic remember it's mostly chronic because it's a venous bleed it takes time to really cause symptoms so it may be acute or chronic and symptoms may take days to weeks to develop and it has a higher rate of recurrence so all i want you to remember from this page is that it bleeds a bleeding into the subdural space it is a bleeding that is venous in origin arises from usually from the shearing or the tearing of the bridging dural veins because it is venous it has a slower onset and progression and a few clinical pictures older individual anticoagulants alcoholics and history of trivial trauma like falls some trivial falls in the bathroom or falls from the stairs or what not and immediately after fall they won't have any symptoms 2 3 weeks after that they'll start developing some symptoms so what are the symptoms you see so remember in sdh there are two types acute sdh and chronic sdh and acute sdh can present like edh with a lucid interval so although lucid interval is typical for an edh it can also be seen in acute sdh so two hemorrhagic conditions where you can see uh, lucid interval is acute sdh and edh more typical or more classical of edh but can also see be seen in acute sdh now chronic sdh which is the most common variety it presents with headache drowsiness confusion and sometimes you can have focal neurological deficit so that's all you need to remember it's a slower onset disease and usually the symptoms come few weeks to months after the history of trauma so headache drowsiness and confusion are very important features so the patient will be completely normal after trauma 3 4 weeks after trivial trauma he may have confusion and only if the doctor traces back will he get to know the history of trauma on imaging remember you have a crescent shaped and this is the most important part of this discussion crescent shaped or banana shaped hemorrhage crescent shaped or banana shaped hemorrhage and rarely 
you have a midline shift so midline shift is more typical for a edh and not for a sdh so crescent shaped or banana shaped bleeding is seen on ct again you can see this white area hypertense area management most of the times especially smaller bleeds reform or resolve spontaneously but larger sdhs may require surgical evacuation so that was about sdh so now we'll talk about subarachnoid hemorrhage remember subarachnoid hemorrhage as seen in this picture is bleeding into the sub arachnoid space that is the space between the arachnoid and the pia it most commonly occurs due to trauma but is also closely associated with rupture of berry aneurysm so remember berry aneurysm is a saccular dilatation usually seen in the circular villus the anterior part of circular villus so it's a saccular dilatation or an aneurysm seen in the anterior part of circular villus it is usually a congenital deformity associated with conditions like adult polycystic kidney disease marfan syndrome and early renal syndrome type 4 but remember It, it occurs due to a congenital absence of the tunica media your artery has three layers tunica intima media and adventitia so at the branching points of certain vessels this tunica media is absent and therefore these vessels develop a dilatation or a saccular dilatation which is called berry aneurysm most commonly seen in the anterior part of, part of the circle of villus so remember sh is frequently associated with ruptures of these arterial or berry aneurysms and trauma so trauma is the most common cause closely followed by rupture of berry aneurysm okay and remember here the bleeding is arterial so edh was arterial sdh was venous in origin and sh is also arterial in origin what are the clinical features and this is a very 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 important point only thing you should remember it presents with a classical thunder clap headache so what is this thunder clap headache the patient will say it is the worst headache of their life they never had such a headache and it is the worst headache of their life ever other than that it can also have nuchal rigidity remember nuchal rigidity is also seen in meningitis due to meningeal irritation similarly here you see nuchal or neck rigidity because the blood in the csf or the blood which is in the subarachnoid space irritates the meninges and leads to similar meningeal irritation and nuchal uh, nuchal rigidity so signs of meningeal irritation also present and there may be some focal neurological disorder also altered consciousness so remember in edh the most important was lucid interval in sdh it was usually a slow onset headache and drowsiness previous history of trauma or history of trauma long back and in sh the most important feature is the thunder clap headache with the patient says is the worst headache of their life so the earliest way to investigate or identify an sh is through ncct non contrast ct and a ct brain or non contrast ct shows this classical appearance here you can see these hyper dense areas which indicate the bleed so all these hyper dense area indicate the bleed very easy to make out sh also you can see xanthochromia in the csf so remember there is blood and blood products in the csf and this blood is broken down into uh, i mean the rbcs in the blood are broken down into bilirubin products and this gives a yellowish yellowish color or a yellowish tinge to the csf normally csf is a clear fluid but in xanthochromia you get a yellowish color to the csf because of the bleeding or because of the subarachnoid bleed so xanthochromia is seen in sah it develops usually 2 to 2 weeks or within 2 to 2 weeks after the after the bleed occurs remember nccd is the earliest and most important and you should know how to identify this image so that was all about sh thunder clap headache is the most important feature and your history usually in exams you will have this these the phrasing worst headache of their life okay so now we'll talk about intraparenchymal hemorrhage that is nothing but bleeding in directly into the brain tissue or directly into the brain parenchyma most important point to note we always think edh is the most common but remember it is not the most common type of intracranial hemorrhage is the intraparenchymal or intracerebral hemorrhage okay and is usually associated with hypertension therefore it's the most common and there is something called or it's most commonly associated with the rupture of something called a charco bouchard micro aneurysm so what is this charco bouchard micro aneurysm so we already told aneurysms are abnormal dilatations of the vessels or the arteries so remember in the brain you have the circular villus so here we have the circular villus and you have the MCA or the middle cerebral artery which goes like this and this middle middle cerebral artery gives out many small branches which supply the deeper structures of the brain so many small branches and these arteries or these small branches are called lenticular striate vessels so these small branches are called lenticular striate vessels and sometimes you can have these because of years of hypertension you can have damage to the wall of these lenticular striate vessels and you can have development of small aneurysms okay they are called micro aneurysms or charco bush you can see it here charco bouchard micro aneurysm so because of years of hypertension there is weakening of the arterial wall of the lenticular striate vessels and these vessels start to dilate leading to formation of my or charco bouchard micro aneurysms 
and as the hypertension continues eventually these will rupture and lead to a bleed in this area okay so you'll have rupture of the microaneurysm remember the most common site of intraparenchymal or intracerebral hemorrhage is the basal ganglia particularly the putamen again because this comes in the region of supply of these lenticulocyte arteries so we always think it is the cerebral hemispheres that are more common or cerebral cortex that is most commonly affected remember it is not the cerebral cortex but the basal ganglia putamen and why basal ganglia because these are this region is supplied by the lenticulostriate vessels which undergo charcot-bouchard microaneurysm formation and which rupture eventually also can be seen with trauma and av malformation most important remember hypertension charcot-bouchard and commonly seen in basal ganglia features include headache nausea vomiting alter consciousness same as everything so that was this is the ct appearance within the parenchyma you can see a bleed i'll show you a cross and then you'll never forget it so again within the parenchyma you can see a bleed so lastly before we close up this has all four pause and try to answer or look at the ct and try to say which type of bleed it is and then i'll tell you which it is so pause look at them and try to answer okay so remember this one is an edh okay you can see the lenticular shape bleed this one is an sth you can see a crescent shape bleed this one is an intra parenchymal or intra cerebral bleed and this one is your sh and if you can make out these you are definitely made you good use of this session and you will definitely get one question from this in the exam at least one question from one of these bleeds in the exam mostly edh or sth okay so you should know how to differentiate the ct okay so that's it for today thank you hope it was good